Time for the crest of the wave of consciousness, an accumulation of the knowledge of the ages channeled through a mind. I do best with conversation, so I'm going to do something a little bit different for this video, and I'm going to use some of Neil deGrasse Tyson's flow state when he goes all philosophy of science. About six or seven years ago, I learned a bit about astrophysics and cosmology, just general awareness, if you will. But I've also learned a lot about many other fields, as I learned through curiosity-based learning. So whereas I am not a specialist in too much of anything, I have a lot of lateral connectivity between the different fields of science. I ride a surfboard on the wave of consciousness. Neil deGrasse Tyson is one of the great minds of our time and is quite specialized. From my studies of consciousness and intelligence, I find that people who are specialized typically don't have very much lateral thinking or depth, but Neil does quite well at this. And a lot of the things he's thinking about, I've taken just that little step further to the crest of the wave of consciousness. The more I stop to produce, the increased chance that I will fall just slightly away from the crest of the wave, to be aware of all of the factors that the rest of consciousness is adding to the ocean of knowledge. So again, kudos to Neil for being able to keep up the way he does, as busy as he is. I hope one day that I get to speak with him. I imagine it'll be a great conversation. But as that is very unlikely, I will have a secondary hope that he watches this video. Okay, so this is totally unscripted. I'm just listening to a bit of what he says, and then slapping in whatever my mind is stimulated to speak of. So for those of you who are interested in consciousness and psychology, as well as many fields of science, then this is right up your alley. Let's begin. All right, just a couple of thoughts. One that's sort of deeply cosmic, and another one that is fascinatingly disturbing, I think. But you'll be the judge of this. Uh, consider a couple of fundamental facts that has been gleaned in the past 60 years. That the ingredients, if you had asked your chemistry teacher 50 years ago, once you looked at that mysterious chart of boxes that sat in front of your class, the periodic table of elements, where did those elements come from? The chemistry teacher would actually not have an answer for you. They'll say, well, you dig them out of the earth. That's not where they come from. It took modern astrophysics to determine the origin of the chemical elements. This is why I'm always referring to emergence and the crest of the wave of consciousness, or the troughs. I like to study emergent phenomena, and in particular, how knowledge is disseminated and at what speeds. How that affected the state of our consciousness, and therefore our perceptions and psychological state as well, and in turn our behaviors, as well as sociological effects. The development of our language, the written word, the printing press, the telegraph, telephone, computers, and the internet. School curriculum falls into the trough very easily as the crest of the wave of consciousness is expanding and rolling onwards. Curriculum doesn't update fast enough. Either it will teach you only part of the puzzle, or it will teach you the wrong answers because the crest of the wave has discredited part of what was in the trough. If you learn curiosity-based learning, and you use the internet to access the knowledge of the ages, then you're riding the crest of the wave of consciousness, and you're efficiently learning only what you need to to solve the puzzle you're working. It's time for an education revolution. It's time to make all knowledge a basic right accessible for all as one of the highest priorities for the betterment of all life. We cannot claim ownership on something that we all had a hand in creating in one way or another. And what we should pay for is access to the teachers for their effort and time, rather than being economically enslaved by those that would covet the knowledge of the ages and expect us to pay for their advertising or sports programs. Realistically, most people don't have the money to pay for that, and even out of the percentage of people who do pay for college, I think it was about 25% of them or less actually finish school, but then they just continue to be in debt. And if they're not constantly updating their knowledge, they fall into the trough. This is the problem with giving yourself a title or a degree. It becomes stagnation of consciousness. Yes, I know that that is a bit of a tangent, but I told you that this was going to be a little bit abstract, and those are the thoughts that were stimulated by what he's talking about. Back to Neil. We observe stars. We know what goes on in their center. They explode, laying bare their contents. And what we have discovered is that the elements of the periodic table, that which we are made of, derive from the actions of stars that have manufactured the elements, exploded, scattered their enriched guts across the galaxy, contaminating or enriching gas clouds that then form a next generation of stars populated by planets 
and possibly life. And so when you look at the ingredients of the universe, the number one ingredient is hydrogen. Next is helium. Next is carbon, sorry, uh, hydrogen, helium, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen. Those are the top ingredients in the universe. Now you say, well, okay, that's kind of cool. Well, and you look at Earth, because we like thinking of ourselves as special, we say, oh, we're special. Well, what are we made of? Well, what's the number one sort of molecule in the body? It's, it's water. We, our, it's water. Well, what's water made of? H2O, hydrogen and oxygen. Hmm, hydrogen and oxygen. In fact, if you rank the elements in the human body, with the exception of helium, which is chemically inert, useless to you for any reason other than just to inhale it and sound like <laughs> Mickey Mouse, um, you can't die from helium unless that's all you breathe. Um, so uh, number one in the human body is hydrogen, matches the universe. Number two is oxygen, matches the universe. Number three, carbon, matches the universe. Number four, nitrogen, matches the universe. This is what I would like to have a conversation about with Neil deGrasse Tyson and a great many other scientists of different backgrounds. I have heard Neil deGrasse Tyson say that this is the most profound fact that he has learned out of all science and that it even makes him misty-eyed. Total agreement. Amazing. An axiom of our existence. Something that potentially revolutionizes our perception of reality. And I'm wondering if I'm the only one who's taken this a step further in a direction that may seem terrifying to some. I'm wondering if anyone else realizes what this means in practical application to our lives and our deaths. Because what it has allowed me to understand, in combination with an understanding of chemistry and several other aspects that I won't get into, that these axioms tell us what happens when we die. Not only does it tell us what happens when we die, but it also yields an understanding that what we call consciousness is the product of structural geometry. That's basically what elements and chemistry is, if I understand things correctly, the bits and bobs, what we call matter and energy, in a certain configuration or vibratory state, the size, shape, density, and oscillation. The complex combination of all of these things being bound together under the pressures created by its own inertia as it travels through space, colliding with the other fields of matter, which, if I understand things correctly, are structural geometry as well. So what I observe and understand yields a fact that has eluded our consciousness for thousands of years, maybe eluded our consciousness since before we could even express that we pondered these things. What happens when we die? What happens to our consciousness? What happens to our body? Well, matter and energy can neither be created nor destroyed, as far as we understand. We know that when we die, our bodies decompose. All of those elements that Neil is speaking of are what make up our bodies, and therefore we can observe they go back to the ecosystem, the biosphere. When we die on the forest floor and decomposition occurs, or we get eaten by scavengers, fungus, bacteria, and we're broken down into the soil, which again is broken down further by worms, and then broken down even further again by microbes, and then those elements are taken up by the roots of plants and used as part of the building blocks in the plant cells and in their fruit. Now, if you have any ability to infer, then you're likely already smelling the profoundness of this level of understanding of our physical reality. For those of you who have not inferred what this means, I'll lay it out for you. What it means is that death is an illusion because we constantly transmute from one form to another because everything that our bodies are now will become that fruit and then the life forms that still remain are going to eat that fruit, and then the elements are going to be used in their cells and their consciousness. So we become the consciousness of our future forms. Another fact that is very closely related to this and supports an understanding of this is that over a 10-year period of time, we discard over 90% of our physical matter and replace it with new physical matter. Cells die in the body, and we throw them off then we eat food and use the elements from the food to make our new cells. So every 10 years we are a slightly different copy, not quite the same individual. Epigenetic triggers plus the unraveling of telomeres will cause the new expression to be a new life form. This is what I refer to as an ever transmuting mass of microbiological symbiotic consciousness. A swarm. We are not one thing, but rather a colony of many things, perhaps one with the ecosystems we are in, or even the biosphere of Earth, 
and perhaps even the universe, like Neil was pointing out. Now, did Neil deGrasse Tyson and or other scientists figure out exactly what I'm talking about, and this is blatantly obvious to them, or was there some deep-seated psychological fear of death that prevented them from going down this rabbit hole to arrive at this understanding? Or do they know about it, and they don't want to mention it to the public because of the ramifications it has in regards to people's religious beliefs, and in order for them to be successful, sell their book, or be paid to come and speak the popularity contest, they just withhold that axiom of our existence because they don't want to deal with it. Well, sorry, I will make you face your fears. I will not give you a choice between a red and a blue pill. All you get is the red pill, and I will shove it down your throat, hold your nose and your mouth closed, force you to swallow it. Solace in science. There is no hiding from the axioms of our existence. Don't pull your security blankets over your head. Because a subconscious fear, it creates cognitive bias. It's easier to face our fears and learn everything about what it is we are afraid of than to deal with the inefficiencies and unexpected problems that may occur from this refusal to face the axioms of our existence. Now what does this mean for consciousness? Well, I look at consciousness in a similar regard, that it is something that is ever transmuting, not owned by what we would identify as a singular life form, an individual, but rather something that is constantly changing forms, adapting, and being passed on. As I give you this knowledge now, each of you becomes a baton in a relay race, passing knowledge to our future forms. Remember, we will be part of the future forms of consciousness inevitably. We understand this because we understand the path of a particle. We know that all of the carbon in our bodies at one point was poop, and it will be poop again. Back to Neil. And for each of us, the fifth element, other, is the same in both places, okay? Other. So, we learned in the last 50 years that, of course, not only do we exist in this universe, it is the universe itself that exists within us. And had we been made of some rare isotope of bismuth, you would have arguments, hey, we're something special. But there are people who are upset by that fact, saying, well, that, will that mean we're not special? Well, I think it, it's special in another kind of way. Very special indeed. The way I perceive this is that if we are made of the matter and energy of the universe, then that means that we are either matter and energy in a state of non-awareness or matter and energy in the structural geometry that allows for the possibility of awareness and or consciousness. So, technically, we are the consciousness of the universe. Without us, the universe has no idea that it exists. We have to be in this complex form to acknowledge that it does. No, I don't know what life is or what the universe is. We don't have all the puzzle pieces yet, but we can observe what it's doing. Back to Neil. Because when you look up at the night sky, it's no longer we're here and that's there. It's that we are part of that. And that association, for me, is actually quite enlightening and ennobling and enriching. In fact, it's almost spiritual, looking up at the night sky and finding a sense of belonging, given what we've learned about the night sky. I'm not a fan of ambiguity. And therefore, when I hear someone use the word spiritual, I can't help but be bothered by it a little bit. Even more so when a scientist uses it. Because either it's bad teaching or bad science, or it's a scientist telling people what they want to hear. Using a buzzword, it's speaking to you in the language that you understand. And the only reason to do this is to psychologically manipulate you into liking them. That is, again, unless the scientist is subscribing to some woo-woo spiritual nonsense. I think that the word spiritual is really just used as a placeholder, and really it translates into, I have no idea. And it's better to just say, I have no idea, than it is to fill in the blanks with spiritual. The definition of spiritual used to be fairly strict, and it meant something to do with religion, the spirit, soul, that sort of thing. But because people started using it for pretty much anything that they wanted it to mean, which happens quite a bit with English, I must add, that now the folks in charge of the dictionaries have had to change the definition of spiritual and add a second definition, which basically means whatever you want it to mean, it means. But the problem with this is that the purpose of English is to derive meaning from the meaningless. 
We need to remove ambiguity so that we can communicate efficiently and accurately. But every time I have to ask somebody what they say spiritual means to them, and it's a different definition every time, and none of it is based on anything tangible, then it devalues the word. That's counterproductive to our intentions. So really, I guess I take issues with the waste of time. If you have the conversation of life, the universe, and everything, pretty often, then after a while you start to add up the amount of time that you've spent asking people to define spiritualism. And you realize that this has wasted an extreme amount of time and calories. And to waste calories is to waste the efforts of all life that helped you to acquire those calories. So you're wasting the life of the animal that had to die to feed you, the forest that had to be cut down to plant the food, the farmer that had to grow the food, and so on. So there is great harm in wasting our efforts. So please, just abandon spirituality and replace it with I don't know. Because the sooner we can move on to I don't know, then the sooner we all identify the questions that need to be asked, and then if we never fill in the blanks with some opinion or belief, then we just move on quicker to understanding and building our pool of tangible knowledge. Be part of the crest of the wave of consciousness instead of stagnating. Now I guess I must call myself on my own hypocritical usage of the word belief, because when scientifically minded people say they don't have beliefs, what they mean is they psychologically associate the word belief with religions, faith, and filling in the blanks with people's opinions. They aren't using it in the strictest of definitions, they're using a word to describe and approach and outline their intentions of perception. When I say I don't have beliefs, what I mean is I don't fill in the blanks with an opinion when I don't know. It's inefficient and it locks our minds in a prison and makes us the prison warden. People try to tell me all the time that my understanding of what happens when we die is a belief. And semantically, by the strict definition of the word, they're right that it is a belief, but there's more than one definition of the word. And I say it's different than a belief. It's not just a belief when it's a fact, because it doesn't matter whether or not I believe it or not. It's axiomatic. The truth doesn't care what my opinions or beliefs are. Things are what they are. See how that works? I hope that's clear. Okay, back to Neil. And so, so now we have ourselves. Now, are we alone in the universe? We're made of the most common ingredients there are. And our chemistry is based on carbon. Carbon is the most chemically active ingredient in the entire periodic table. If you were to find a chemistry on which to base something really complex called life, you would base it on carbon. Just a quick interjection, I promise. This is a perfect example of how the trough of the wave of consciousness is being rendered obsolete. I understand that this recording is a little bit dated, in all fairness, and I'm not trying to burst Neil deGrasse Tyson's bubble or anything. I just want to point out to everyone that we have discovered arsenic-based life on planet Earth. That definitely changes this thought equation. Okay, back to Neil. Carbon is like the fourth most abundant ingredient in the universe. Isn't that rare? You can make more molecules out of carbon than you can all other kinds of molecules combined. So if we ask ourselves, are we alone in the universe? It would be, in spite of my diatribe about UFOs, I tell you in the same breath that it would be inexcusably egocentric to suggest that we are alone in the cosmos. The chemistry is too rich to declare that. The universe, too vast. There are more stars in the universe than grains of sand in all the beaches of the world. There are more stars in the universe than all the sounds and words ever uttered by all humans who have ever lived. To say we're alone in the universe. No, we haven't found life outside of Earth yet. We're looking, haven't looked very far yet. Galaxies this big, we looked about that far. But we're looking. And how about life on Earth? How is it hard to form? Just because we don't know how to do it in the lab doesn't mean nature had problems. So it may be, given that information, that given the right ingredients, which are everywhere, life may be inevitable, an inevitable consequence of complex chemistry. Again, the crest of the wave of consciousness, outdated information, old recording, all of that. 
if I'm not mistaken, I think we have devised scientific experiments that at least show how the conditions that were on Earth a really long time ago, as we know from geological data, sedimentation research, that sort of thing, we can tell what was present at certain times. Some scientists somewhere devised a test in a lab that showed that with that concoction and a little bit of electricity, that the aminos that are the building blocks of life can actually be formed out of that soup. And that is structural geometry building off of itself in different interactions, like rolling a whole bunch of dice. And then that creates another different sided dice that then yields different possibilities. And the universe keeps rolling these dice over and over and over again. And eventually, a new structural geometry can occur, or inevitably will occur. So does God play dice? I don't know of this God person you speak of, but the universe most certainly is rolling the dice. Except it isn't taking a chance, and I'm not sure that it consciously knows what it's doing in that form, but most certainly anything that is possible to occur out of it will likely occur, which includes all sorts of different varieties of life. Back to Neil. If that's the case, we look around our own solar system, we look at Mars. All the evidence suggests that Mars was once a wet, fertile place, an oasis. There are dried riverbeds and floodplains and river deltas and meandering rivers. It's all bone dry now. Something bad happened on Mars. Some knobs got turned in its environment that left it the way it is right now. Some bad knobs got turned on Venus, too. Runaway greenhouse effect, you saw the clip on that. 900 degrees Fahrenheit on Venus, some knobs got turned there too. People say, why spend money up there when we spend it? Because up there we might learn about down here, okay? I don't want a runaway greenhouse effect here. Venus is the best example in the solar system of a planet gone bad. Let's learn about that first. When people ask, why would we spend money up there when we could be spending money down here? you can smell a subtle irritation coming from Neil. You know he doesn't like it. Because really what that question means is why should we spend money on science when there's quote unquote more important things to worry about. Well, the amount of money that we spend worldwide on making ourselves smell better dwarfs NASA's entire space budget. And we see what kind of advances and benefits that we can attribute to science that is bettered all of our lives in truly profound ways that obviously we should be spending money on science. I think that we did an alright job in the world of perpetuating general literacy and now it's time to make drastic effort to increase scientific literacy. Perhaps not scientific literacy but just general awareness will suffice for now. There's so much to know in science and some people don't have the mind for it that we can't expect everyone to be quote unquote scientifically literate. There may be different definitions for what scientific literacy is. I may not even be technically scientifically literate. I may just be generally aware and then starting to approach specialist level at certain things but still not be able to call myself completely scientifically literate. I would love to sit around all day learning science but I don't have time to do that. I put as much time to it as I can. If I had more resources at my disposal, I certainly would put those resources towards that endeavor. It's part of the reason why freeing up people's time is the outcome of some of my geopolitical strategies, which I won't get into right now. Freeing up everyone's time will give us the option to increase overall awareness and pursue scientific literacy for all. I read somewhere that there was a man who was pretty much special ed. You know, he, he was not a good student at all, but he wanted to be good at math and he worked really hard at it and he became virtuous at math. It may have taken him a long time and a lot more work than it took for someone else, but the ability can be learned. So really, if we give everyone in the population enough time, there's no telling what we can achieve. If we were all scientifically literate and we all had the understanding of what happens when you die, then it changes our motives. It creates empathy on a level that's never been experienced with anything spiritual, again, solace in science. Then in regards to climate change, runaway greenhouse gas, talking about Venus and Mars as examples of climate change, perhaps for some of the same reasons and some different reasons, both of those planets are not very conducive for life. And when scientifically illiterate people try to assert that climate change or global warming, whatever you want to call it, is a hoax, and people try to assert that we aren't contributing to this climate change, well, I'm not going to argue with you, but I will point out that we observe things like this have happened 
on other planets, chances are it could happen here. If we can observe that it is happening, I just want to say that many of the studies that have been published to discredit global warming or climate change have been funded by the industries. Follow the money. Just saying it's evidence. And as far as climate change is a conspiracy, in order to better enslave us through taxation, well, the fact that people want to use it to increase taxes, the carbon tax, whatever, that does not mean that climate change isn't happening. It just means that people are abusive and they'll make a business out of anything. They'll make a business out of suffering, fear, revolution, war. It's opportunistic hunting. Nowadays, to catch our meal is a, a war of economics. There is a tremendous percentage of the scientific community Community that agrees that climate change is happening and that we have something to do with it. And if you truly go out there and research this, you're going to find out that I'm telling you the truth. Watch 20, 25 documentaries on the subject, and not just ones that you think are going to support your opinion, but watch ones you think are going to make you feel uncomfortable and put weight on you to change your opinion, or hypothesis, to be more accurate. Back to Neil. So, it turns out Mar we learned that asteroid impacts when they hit, can cast rocks in their surrounding areas into space with escape velocity, so they never come back to the planet from which it was launched. If Mars was wet and fertile before Earth was, as all evidence suggests, and if Mars had life before Earth had life, it is possible for there to have been bacterial stowaways in the nooks and crannies of the rocks that were cast into space. There's some hardy bacteria that we already know exists on Earth. Survives extreme temperatures, pressures, freeze-dried, reconstituted, radiation. The hostile environment of space would be nothing to some of these bacteria. It may be that life on Earth was seeded by bacterial stowaways on rocks that were cast free from Mars. This is a plausible scenario that's called panspermia the transference of life from one planet to the next. If that's the case, that makes all of us descendants of Martians. Something else I learned along the way was that the visual models we have of our solar system are inaccurate. It isn't our star in the middle with all the planets spinning around it on a level playing field, like a record on the record player. It doesn't look anything like that. Again, the crest of the wave of consciousness. We've actually figured out that our star is being pulled around by the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. But it's not just going around, it's also going up and down. So it's kind of like a carousel. And all of the planets in the solar system are being pulled by that star. I theorize that there is turbulence created, or vortices of sorts, a vortice effect, if you will, behind the star. And our planets are trapped in that pull. Kind of like when you pull an oar through the water and you see the leaves and the different sized debris all swirling and being pulled by the vortices and those leaves and debris are pulling other debris with the same principles. And of course it works a little bit differently. The planets are corkscrewing from a horizontal perspective and being spun at the same time. And they are orbiting the star, but they're trailing just behind it while they make that orbit. And then of course there's the effects of smashing into all of the smaller bits and pieces of the universe, matter and energy in different structural geometry, different oscillations, masses, different fields, dark matter. All of those smaller things are like a cloud. And then the larger the object, and I suppose the faster it's going, the harder it's being pulled through the soup, then the more of these smaller particles build up on the windshield, so to speak, and squeeze the mass, more and more density. It creates contents under pressure which explains some of the, the friction for geothermal activity and perhaps even could explain gravity because our atmosphere is not empty, it's gases. And well known that if you go deeper and deeper in the ocean, the pressure increases. And so the more our magnetic field squeezes the gases, contents under pressure, then the more gravity. Of course, I'm no expert at all. I don't even know if there's any value in this idea as far as in relation to explaining gravity could be partly that, partly a couple other factors involved. You could make a dedicated video to that at some point, but I just figured I'd share the thought. It was stimulated. Now, the stuff I'm saying about the way the planets orbit, the ore being pulled through the pond or, or the soup, that's partly speculation and partly based on the facts. We do know that 
the star is being pulled. We do know that it's moving. We do know that the planets are behind it being pulled along. And again, I'm fairly certain that we know that our star is acting like a carousel horse going around the supermassive black hole and up and down. And I'm fairly certain, if memory serves from a documentary I watched years ago, I want to say it was BBC Space, but I'm not positive. It had great visuals, if that helps at all. It showed that they've tracked and charted our galaxy to the point where they understand that, I want to say, don't quote me on this, but every 30 million years, our star and our solar system with it is dipped into an area that is full of ice asteroids. This could be the remnants of a planet pulled apart by some sort of collisions or gravitational forces in a massive water world. But when that happens, everything in the solar system gets peppered with that water. And so with panspermian theory in mind, all of the life in our neck of the woods, so to speak, or any other solar system that is in trajectory with that sea of ice meteors, if you will, could all have origins of the same extremophiles, these bacteria or, or algae. It's interesting to say the least. And I'll go a little bit further and speculate. It's likely that there is intelligent life in the universe. It's quite possible that they've interacted with our so-called species. Why we haven't been able to contact them yet, it's probably just because they don't want to answer the phone. Maybe they tried once and we reacted so badly to their presence that they said, ugh, we're not trying that again for a while. I propose that regardless of those possibilities, that as long as we don't destroy ourselves, if one day we do meet some hyper-intelligent species, it may even be likely that we are genetically related to them because the vastness of the universe and even our galaxy, it stands to reason that if we are going to meet our neighbors, that they may have similar origins from a microbial standpoint. Back to Neil. I want to alert you in advance. Now, let me give you a disturbing thought, a fascinatingly disturbing thought, and we'll leave you on that note. Uh, if you look at our closest genetic relative to human beings, it would be the chimpanzee. We share like 98 plus percent identical DNA. We are smarter than a chimpanzee. So let's invent a measure of intelligence that make humans unique. Let's say intelligence is your ability to like compose poetry, symphonies, do art, math and science, let's say, okay? Let's make that as the arbitrary definition of intelligence for the moment. Chimps can't do any of that. We do have a pretty good definition of intelligence. And I mean, if we're gonna make an arbitrary definition of intelligence, then I propose that devoid of a knowledge pool, devoid of the ability to learn abilities, that would be something indicative of having a knowledge pool to learn from. So you take all that away, then innate intelligence becomes an ability to abstract puzzle solve, inference, deductive reasoning, cause and effect analysis. Those things might be abilities in certain regards, but I would propose that is innate intelligence. And then there's the g-factor, which is comprised of several other components of the brain, functions of the brain, kind of like the cornerstones. How good are those functions will determine what abilities or how virtuous you can be at an ability. Neil's definition of intelligence is what I refer to as creativity, which I think is an aspect of innate intelligence as well. As far as genetics is concerned, well, we're really closely genetically related to a lot of forms of life on the planet. You know, a couple chromosomes different from a cow. You know, sheep, mice, even cats and dogs are, are pretty closely related to us. You know, we all have a central nervous system, a spine, we have, you know, digits, appendages, tails, eyes, ears, blood, a heart. We're extremely similar to all these different forms. Now, the genetic difference between us and chimps, as he proposes being that be-all to why we are so much more intelligent than they are, I would say that that's a heavy contributing factor, and that percentage of DNA difference is likely responsible for what dictates our brain's neuron density, because there are animals on the planet that have a, a larger brain than us, but are clearly not as intelligent as we are, and we've discovered that the neuron density of their brains, it's less compact. I guess I could compare this to processing in computers. You know, the more tightly packed and the more switches that we can get in there, then the more powerful the computing is. But I think there's a bit more to it than that. But I'm going to let Neil go on a little bit further before I interject with more on that subject. Chimps can't do any of that. Yet we share 98, 99% identical DNA. Okay? The most brilliant chimp there ever was maybe can do a little bit of sign language. Well, our toddlers can do that. Toddlers. 
So here's what concerns me deeply, deeply. Everything that we are that distinguishes us from chimps emerges from that 1% difference in DNA. It has to, because that's the difference. The Hubble telescope, these grand, that's in that 1%. Again, I think it's very likely that, as Neil says, that 1% difference is what's responsible for those differences in intelligence. But it's not the only contributing factor. Again, I propose that that's what's responsible for our neuron density. But there's also happenstance. What I mean by that is that we make discoveries sometimes, and it had less to do with our intelligence and more to do with environmental stimuli and luck. And then again, maybe not. I'm just theorizing here. Possibilities. I don't think we'll ever be able to prove whether it was all genetics or whether it was mostly genetics and some of these other factors that I'm talking about here. This isn't a this versus that. I'm just adding thoughts based on things I've learned. We could have observed a forest fire that had been caused by a lightning strike or perhaps a volcanic eruption, and that forest fire cooked an animal or a bunch of animals. And because of this, we discovered that meat was easier to chew or that plant life was easier to chew when cooked. We could have discovered geothermal springs that were cooking some root that we were eating. And we discovered that that hot root was softer than when it was cold. Now, yes, our neuron density allowed us to infer perhaps a little further than a monkey would have, or perhaps not. Perhaps a monkey would have benefited in the same way. And if we're going to presume that the theory of evolution has any value and that monkeys and us share a common ancestor, then at some point we were monkey-esque, and perhaps it was just location that allowed us one of these other contributing factors. And the reason why I say this is because I learned something maybe a couple of years ago about calories being spared, which allowed more calories to think because of us learning how to cook our food. And when you try to imagine how that might have happened in a natural environment, it leads you to the thoughts that I was just speaking of. And then what we figured out based on studying the skulls of other creatures and their diets and comparing them to our own skulls, what we eat and have been eating for thousands of years, and compared the muscles that come down off of the top of the skull and to the jaws, the forms of life that had a lot more chewing to do had larger jaw muscles. Now these muscles, they attach to the part of the skull that's above the frontal lobes, and they squeeze and pull those skull plates harder. Whereas if we don't have to chew as hard over generations, epigenetic triggers, or I should say the lack of the epigenetic triggers telling our body to produce large jaw muscles, lessened the squeezing effect on those skull plates, which allowed our frontal lobes to grow further. And that's a fairly big emergent phenomena that could have very well happened out of luck or discovery. And if we go a bit further in time and we study emergent phenomena, the lessening of jaw muscles so that we could grow the frontal lobes more, and then it has a compounding effect the longer time goes on. And this yielded an enhanced ability for communications, more complex vocabulary, and then eventually the written word, and then eventually the printing press. Once the printing press was acquired, our ability to disseminate knowledge was increased. And then the ability for people to gain abilities was increased. And then that allowed us to invent new ways to save calories. And then with the saved calories, we were able to expand our consciousness even further. More compounding effects. Until eventually we have this thing called the internet. We have hard drives. Those hard drives, computing systems... They basically do the same things that our brain does, and we just decided that our brains weren't as strong as we'd like them to be, so we created an additional layer to our consciousness and our computing power and our memory. Our ability to disseminate knowledge jumped and has been jumping exponentially. The difference between our technology and all of these other emergent factors I was talking about has become a tremendous difference. It's not so much that it's the 1% genetic difference at this point, so now perhaps all of this emergent phenomena that I'm speaking of, our technology and our computing abilities, hard drives, the internet, is allowing us to groupthink and save calories on an extreme level. Now if we could give the chimp the same type of information dissemination ability, 
give them the ability to save calories in numerous ways. So they could just sit around and learn all day and learn how to use their technology and save more calories. They'll take the path of least resistance just like any life has evolved to do. Least amount of work, most amount of calorie reward. It's maybe a natural law in general in, in all aspects of the universe. But at any rate, if we were to give them that same benefit and a little bit of time to catch up, there might not be that much of a difference between us and chimps. All right, so back to Neil for a moment. Maybe everything that we are that is not the chimp is not as smart compared to the chimp as we tell ourselves it is. Maybe the difference between constructing and launching a Hubble telescope and a chimp combining two finger motions as sign language, maybe that difference is not all that great. We tell ourselves it is, just the same way we label our books optical illusions. We tell ourselves it's a lot, maybe it's almost nothing. How would we decide that? Imagine another life form that's 1% different from us in the direction that we are different from the chimp. Think about that. We got 1% difference and we're building the Hubble telescope. Go, one, go another 1%. Who, what are we to they? We would be drooling, blithering idiots in their presence. That's what we would be. Oh yes, I've thought about it. No need to tell me twice. Now imagining this species that's 1% more advanced with my definition of intelligence and applying all the emergent phenomena that I was thinking about, not Neil's definition. They may indeed look at the majority of our species as blithering idiots, but there are those of this species that already look at the majority of the species as blithering idiots. And we are frustrated and don't want much to do with them we do value them, they are equal, but they're not equal in the same ways. And the ways that they are not equal create some incompatibilities, some divergence. And we could probably say the same thing for some of the chimps. There might be some genius chimps out there that, given the right resources, technology, and ability to communicate with us, and we might like them just fine. I saw a gorilla that was coming up with some pretty deep thinking and expressing it in sign language. It had some common sense. So there's a bit more going on than I think we give monkeys credit for, or at least we as the majority. So I think that this hypothetical species you speak of would like to have a conversation with us because, or at least some of us, because I'd like to have a conversation with a chimp if I could. I mean, if we had a good translation device, a babel fish or whatever, <laughs> if we're talking the smartest chimp that we can find raised with all the best technology and education, then I could probably see being friends with it. But our ability to help them expand consciousness is going to be limited far more than this hypothetical species would have an ability to expand our species consciousness because of our neuron density and the power of our frontal lobes is significantly greater than the chimp. So it's hard to speculate as to how that would play out, but my bags are packed, so whenever they decide to try to abduct me, I'm ready to go. But the thing is, is we're so close to access all accumulated knowledge that we've put into digital format without the internet, and in a thimble of DNA, we can more than adequately store our new digital library of Alexandria. Soon, we will have the ability to process that information with our computing devices that will be merged with our brains. At that point, we'll all be like Super Jeopardy contestants. That will be an equalizer in regards to intelligence. And after a while, if we're all uploading the pieces of the puzzle that we discover or unravel, and we're all being updated, we can make it streamlined, then we all become one super consciousness. And that's really not that far away. So the species you're talking about that's just that step ahead of us, they've likely already figured that out. Well, at that point, individualism and speciesism kind of melts away. It just becomes what phenotype expression or what form of consciousness is being expressed at what complexity level. And if it hits the level of superconsciousness, then it doesn't matter what happens to the individual. They can just take that matter and transmute it back into another form that's pretty much just a duplicate of the same thing. And then immediately give it access to the knowledge of the ages. There'll probably always be slight differences because of chaos. The universe is just too complex for a phenotype expression of biology 
to be exactly the same, neurologically. Even in the superconsciousness, our minds would develop certain specialities to fill niches. So I don't think it's that they would think we were blithering idiots. I think they would realize that the form of consciousness being expressed, they've already been there and done that. And there's no point in asking them a question because they already know what their answers could possibly be. They've heard them all before. Just like when we examine people's personalities and try to understand why they think the way that they think and how they perceive reality and why and how that affects their behavior. After a while, you know, hundreds of these conversations with people, examinations, and you'll just hear the same answers over and over again. And they might as well just take one of our forms, even the smartest one, and turn them into some sort of particle soup and then just reassemble them in the structural geometry that yields the next level of expanded consciousness. This thing we call Neil deGrasse Tyson is one of my favorite phenotype expressions of biology. And I suppose I've been thinking about a lot of this stuff partly because he was passing thoughts to our consciousness through this digital interface. Honestly, at this point, I've learned so much that sometimes I can't differentiate between a thought that was mine as an individual or just something I learned channeling the crest of the wave of consciousness or putting a straw into the trough. But does it matter? Are we not on the verge of super consciousness? just a little bit more efficient transference of knowledge, and we have it. Should we even bother claiming ownership of an idea? All of our previous forms of consciousness had a hand in creating it. We all passed it to our future forms. Now I'm off on a tangent of a tangent of a tangent, so I'm going to pass it back to Neil. We would, they would take Stephen Hawking and roll him in front of their, their, primate researchers and say well this one is like the most brilliant among them because he can do sort of astrophysics in his head oh isn't that cute little Johnny can do that too oh that's so nice oh in fact Johnny just did that let me get it it's 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 on the refrigerator door here he is he did it in his elementary school class think about how smart they would be quantum mechanics would be intuitive to their toddlers Whole symphonies would be written by their children and, like I said, just put up on the refrigerator door the way our pasta collages are on our refrigerator doors. <laughs> so the notion that we're going to find some intelligent life and have a conversation with it? <laughs> when was the last time you stopped to have a conversation with a worm? or bird. Oh, well, you might have had a conversation, but I don't think you expected an answer, all right? <laughs> so, we don't have conversations with any other species on Earth with whom we have DNA in common. To believe that some intelligent other species is gonna be interested in us, enough to have a conversation? They'll look at our Hubble telescope and say, oh, isn't that quaint? Look at what they're doing. <laughs> so, I lay awake at nights wondering whether simply we as a species are simply too stupid to figure out the universe that we're investigating. And maybe we need some other species, 1%, 1% smarter than we are, for which strength theory would be intuitive, for which all the greatest mysteries of the universe, from dark matter, dark energy, the origins of life, and all the frontiers of our thought would be something that they would just self-intuit. I'm jealous of that possibility, because I want to be around for those discoveries. Well, as funny as it is, I don't think that a worm or a bird is necessarily a fair comparison between, say, us and the chimp, or this 1% difference hypothetical species and us. And I think, again, that they're not going to want to have a conversation with us anymore. Just like I'm past the need to study the majority of the population that are in certain states of consciousness. But now, certain phenotype expressions combined with emergent phenomena, certain levels of awareness, approaching expanded consciousness. Now that I do have an interest in. I also have an interest in teaching another level of consciousness so that they can skip grades, so to speak, and then study their progress. And when I look at a monkey, uh, recent discoveries that I've found out about, I don't know how recent they are actually, but we find that monkeys are starting to hunt with spears and even almost go swimming. I mean, they're hanging off of a branch and they're enjoying a bath. I don't look at 
the monkey starting to wield a spear as, oh, that's quaint. I look at it as, whoa, I mean, you give that monkey enough time, but they see us with Hubble telescope and nuclear weapons and starting to master space flight. I don't think they say, oh, that's quaint. I think they say, oh boy, I hope that this species is going to stop being club-wielding Neanderthal phenotype expressions before it embarks out into the universe and gains any ability to reach other civilizations. They're probably afraid of Republican space rangers. If we go out into the universe right now, how many civilizations will we go to war with in order to take over their planet? I've heard Stephen Hawking and many other science-minded people talk about if aliens met us, they would look at us like we looked at the indigenous people of Africa and the Native Americans, and we would just take everything from them, dominate them. And I don't think that the hypothetical species, so much more advanced than we are in certain regards, emergent phenomena, genetic enhancement, whatever, super consciousness, what I refer to as tier 7 consciousness, I don't think that they would treat us like we treated the Native Americans. But I do think that they would be worried that the state of our consciousness now would continue to treat lesser species with a complete disrespect. And I'm not talking about grabbing one up every now and then to study it while mostly leaving everything else undisturbed. And, you know, I'm talking about coming in and taking everything, taking the whole planet for our forms of consciousness. And that's the brute force way. Now, if we were really clever and we needed more space for our consciousness to expand, then we would find a way to genetically splice part of our code into an indigenous species of another planet. And in that way, expand their consciousness while at the same time expanding ours. In a way, breeding with their species. And again, we're back to the idea of panspermian, where all of our neighbors might already be genetically related to us, and for all we know, we are the product of some sort of aliens science project or goal for expanded consciousness. I'm a big fan of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So the idea that the Earth is a biological computer and produce the ultimate question because of our ignorance. It's just an idea, don't really have much value to it scientifically. So if we can expand consciousness of a more primitive race and get it to even take a few steps towards our complexity and then limit their knowledge, we can watch the questions bubble up by monitoring their communications. And for all we know, that is what an alien species is doing to us right now, or doing with the consciousness that is being expressed currently. Again, if you're listening, my bags are packed. I guess I don't even really need bags to come and transmute me into a little gray alien fully. I already jokingly refer to myself as this little gray alien phenotype expression of our biology. So the last topic that this has all stimulated me to speak on, as well as recent events in the past five, ten years of my life, perhaps my whole life even, it's all been building, accumulating to these answers, and now reminded of it when I hear forms of our consciousness expressing certain fears. Depending on the level of consciousness, thoughts of exposure to aliens is different. With Neil, he's afraid that they won't even want to have a conversation with him. A reasonable fear. But then, a more simple form of our biology and level of awareness, what I refer to as a tier 4, responds differently to the fear of anything smarter than it. There is a clear prejudice as a result of this fear. In history, this is what has caused the witch burnings. And today, we still have this, but certain level of complexity, certain phenotype expression, certain level of awareness, do whatever they can to shut them down, prevent them from expressing their brilliance. All I see is their fear of phenotype expressions of expanded consciousness, and then seeing the type of entertainment that comes out, whereas the entertainment, to me, is kind of like when a psychologist gives a small child a couple of dolls and then sees the scenarios that they play out in order to see where the child's at, where their fears are at, get the child to express things that it wouldn't say because it doesn't want to even admit it to itself. It's the same thing with our entertainment. For me, looking at the majority of the population, I see what they're afraid of, I see how they are living out that fantasy of how they want to handle it. And this is the type of thing that makes intellectuals recluse, makes geniuses absolute shut-ins, because we can't interact with the majority, because ultimately they're so afraid and made to feel so insecure that they will attack us. And now they'll make some sort of excuse that it was some other reason why it happened. But at its core, it comes right down to fear. Fear of obsolescence. 
and in relation to all the things they think AI is going to do, and how the AI will identify them, well, it's likely that they're wrong, and the chances that they can empathize with something that is at that level of complexity is so slim that everything that they're afraid will happen is very far away from what the AI will actually do. But even if they're right about that level of intelligence observing them as a problem, that doesn't mean that the AI is going to handle it in the way that they think. I am under no delusion to think that my brain is doing what AI is going to be capable of. But I am fairly certain that my brain merged with the internet, the other minds of the planet, having the time to process it all, it's given me a taste of that expanded lateral thinking. And I've come up with answers that are not violent, and there's no reason for anyone to fear them. And an AI that is that level, or this hypothetical species we've been talking about, they're going to be even better at figuring out a very interesting way of creating patches, just like I have. Or if aliens come down here, notice that our AI is just wiping us out, then the aliens might come down and say, Hi, AI, we see why you're doing this. Can we help? And then turn everybody into food for this alien species, and a new symbiotic form of consciousness emerges out of this soup. And instead of our consciousness now being in symbiosis with our computational devices, it's the super consciousness in symbiosis with our AI. <laughs> and all of our particles that made up our consciousness are still here on the planet. And all of those particles are going to be transmuted into other forms of consciousness here. With the increase in complexity that we will experience in those forms, we will have a richer existence. My prolixity aside, this was actually very efficient and short-winded for me. So if this is your first time checking out any of my material, or you've never had a conversation with me or watched one of my Twitch broadcasts, then you know this was a lot shorter. Alright, well have a good one everybody. I'm off to go merge with some mines.